we've been praying for really the better part of a month or two about how can we bless our city. Uh, we're, we're really blessed people here at church, and we just find ourselves in just the greatest season ever. It's kind of crazy. We were talking about the other day. We're four years old as a church. We're a toddler, and uh, in that short amount of time, we've seen a lot of crazy stuff, and we're in the strongest, healthiest season we've ever been as a church, financially, with our staff, with our team. And so we just said, Lord, this season, we just want to find a way to bless our city. Can you give us an opportunity to be generous? And uh, this CAPS project came along, man, and so we just wanted to go ahead and do that and, and really celebrate all that, that God is doing. That's part of what this is, being generous is us celebrating how faithful God has been to us um, at Captivate. You know, sometimes in ministry, the weeks like blend together uh, for me because they just happen every week. Like people will come up to me and say, hey, that message you preached four weeks ago. I'm like, yeah, I don't remember. You know, like I say a lot of things and um, you wake up Monday and you're like, let's do it again. You know, and so you kind of keep moving on. And so I've learned in ministry, if you don't stop to celebrate, you suffocate because it's just overwhelming over and over again. And that's true in life. That's true with our kids. That's true in your business. Like if you don't stop to celebrate, Celebrate. That happens, man. It, it gets overwhelming. And so this is really a thing for us where we're stopping, we're celebrating the faithfulness to God, to us really in our church in this amazing season, and we want to be generous. And I tried to listen to everything that she said, but she was kind of cute, so it's hard for me to focus. Um, she's my wife. Anyway, uh, let's move on. But um, today I'm really excited because uh, we're continuing our series on the seven deadly sins. Um, hopefully it's been good for you, but in these weeks we've been talking about pride, greed, Greed, lust, envy, gluttony. Today I'm talking about wrath. Ah, people are mad. And uh, next week, I'm gonna wrap it up talking about sloth. So if you wanna hear about how lazy you are, come next week, all right, I'll tell you. And uh, that's quite a sell for next week. Anyway, um, but uh, these are the sins that derail our lives. And so over these weeks, we've been talking about the biblical virtues that really deliver us, that rescue us, that bring us back to life. All throughout church history, thousands of years ago, in scripture, and even today in 2022, these are the themes that come to the surface. These are the things that we struggle with, even sometimes when we don't know it. You know, some of the biggest weaknesses in our life, we're not even like privy to them. We don't realize they're there. And so part of what we've talked about in the series is sometimes the devil knows our weaknesses better than we do. And that's not helpful because he knows how to lure us. He knows how to trick us. And so that's why I've been praying for all of us throughout these seven weeks to have moments where we look at some of these sins and say, oh, wow, that's a bigger issue in my life than I thought. I thought I had that one wrapped up and under control, but after talking about it, maybe there's some stuff to pray through. Maybe there's some stuff to actually figure out and give to the Lord. It's kind of like today we're talking about wrath, right? And for some of you are like, that's not really my issue. Uh, that's not my problem. I had a good year when it comes to wrath. Didn't kill anybody, you know? I only canceled a few people way less than last year. It's been a good year. And that might be true for you, um, except maybe deep down, uh, you wouldn't mind so much if somebody certain in your life or in the world, I don't know, disappeared or like wasn't here anymore. Um, if you saw them right now, it might be a little weird. It might be kind of heavy. They're might be some tension. You'd never say it out loud, but you wouldn't mind so much if they like failed or something, you know? That's a sin, by the way. Um, it's called wrath. Yeah, it's wrath. And that might be in there a little bit more than you think. Um, for some of us, wrath will be the sin that so easily entangles us, especially if we ignore it. And that's what we've been saying week after week. It's easy to ignore sin, right? There's the skeptics of the church that say, can we stop talking about sin? Like the church uses sin to make people feel bad and guilt them into doing stuff and giving their money and all that. It's archaic. Can we drop it? And we've said week after week, we can't drop it because we all feel the effects of sin every single day. The decisions that we make, the decisions other people make, things people say to us, right? We see it on a global scale. When you watch the news, you see what sin can do. It's painful and it's tragic. And yet there's this anti-God message that says, man, we don't need God to solve our problems. We don't need God to solve our sins. We can handle it on our own. We got technology, we got philosophy, we got science, like we're good, right? But if we take an honest look at the world, I think we can all admit, um, we don't got this, right? Like the more godless the world becomes, the more hopeless it becomes. And we feel that, like things we used to rely on God for, we're now relying on ourselves. And so what does that do? It adds pressure to us and it makes anxiety go really high. I gotta solve my own problems now. I gotta figure out the human condition. I know that we're broken and kind of messed up and it's on me to figure it out. That's a lot, that's a lot. We don't have answers to some of these problems. Only God does, but we're not really going to him anymore. And so stress goes up, anxiety goes up, pressure, and it's this added feeling of I gotta go, go, go and be more and achieve more and we crash. We crash, we end up sinning, we end up hurting each other as humans over and over again. There's a lot of brokenness. 
right? But because we're made in the image of God, there's something in our nature that says, I wanna see justice though. I wanna see restoration. I wanna see life and hope. I wanna see justice, right? But because we're not going to God for that anymore, we make up our own version of justice, right? Where we're the judge, not God. And when that happens, that's dangerous because you know justice is no longer kind of built on like grace and the gospel and forgiveness. Now it's built on like slander and wrath and resentment sometimes. Um, and that leads to things like cancel culture where nobody is safe. And that comes from what? From pride. It's pride that leads to wrath, which says to God, my version of justice is better than yours. They need to pay and I'm going to make them pay. And that's called wrath. All right, and here's how I'm gonna define it for us today. Wrath is uncontrolled feelings of anger and hate. These feelings can manifest in impatience, revenge, slander, and even violent fantasies on the freeway. You know what I mean? That's where they happen. Anyway, it's where we trust our version of justice above God's, where we are now judge, jury, and executioner. And you're like, yo, that sounds real intense. That's not me, right? It can't be me. And that I believe that this is the one sin in our life that hides the most. It kind of just hides. Because there are some sins that like have a hard time hiding, right? It's kind of hard to hide lust because it gives you this like tingly feeling. It feels like a fire in your stomach like we talked about a couple weeks ago. It's hard to hide greed because greed's like, ooh, look at the new sparkly thing on Amazon that I get to buy. You know, it's like exciting. Hard to hide that. It's hard to hide gluttony because it's all over our face as we slurp it down, the thing that we're longing for. Um, but anger is not like that. Anger can sneak its way into your soul and just stay there for years. Anger is often the thing that comes out like a year after seeing a therapist, you know? Like you've been meeting with a therapist for about a year and you're talking about all the people you don't like and the bad habits and the mess ups. You're like trying to figure out what's wrong with me, right? At the therapist. And then after about a year, your therapist looks at you and they're like, you know what I think it is? I think you're still angry at your father. And you're like, what? No, that can't be it. Did I pay money for that? That's not it, no way, right? And then your therapist stares back at you in silence with that really educated, astute, expensive stare as they stare into your soul. And they're giving time and space for you to figure out on your own, holy cow, they're right, they're right. That makes sense. Dad left at 12, it messed up mom, it made me kind of messed up. Now I don't let people get close to me. At least that's what my last four girlfriends said. I didn't listen to any of them. They were crazy. They were right, right? And that's the hiddenness of the sin. It kind of just creeps in and stays there a while. And because we are being discipled by culture to only stay at the surface, that there is a superficiality to our culture, even in church, where I stay only up here. And when you only stay up here, you don't deal with what's going on down here in the lower parts. We called it the shallows a couple months ago. It's the emails and the to-do list and the thing I'm trying to get done in my life. And it's the shallows. A lot of us stay there. That's why we're so anxious. And then we have what we call midtown. Those are like the cares of life. How am I gonna buy a house in San Diego? My parents are aging. What am I gonna do about that? And there are these cares that we have. But then there's what we call the depths, the deep part of your soul. It's what the Bible calls your inner being. And that's where your spiritual life is actually formed. And that's where it takes place. The problem is there's often like this resentment tank down there and there's some wrath and anger and we never deal with it. It just stays there for years, sometimes generations. And here's what happens. It ends up getting leaked out on a whole bunch of people in your life that had nothing to do with your original offense. They were not a part of your offense, but now they're a part of your assault because it never went dealt with. And it's hiding down below. And let me tell you, the devil would love nothing more than to keep it hidden. And that's why every single week we've been talking about, you know, today's the day. Today we're digging it up. Grab a shovel, right? Like we're gonna dig that sucker up and look at it and pray over it and talk about it. We don't want it down there, right? The devil wants to protect it in your life, but you gotta stop hiding it so Jesus can heal it. I'll say it like this. Jesus can't often heal what we choose to conceal. We cover it up and we hide it. It's been such an interesting vantage point for me <laughs> these last several weeks as I bring up these sins and these strongholds, because I see people looking at me like, don't mess with my sin, you know? Like people are staring back, not like out loud, but like figuratively on the inside. Don't talk about my friend gluttony like that, you know? It's been very helpful to me. Let's not talk about my pride and my lust issue. I'm not done with it yet, right? A lot of these sins have become our friends. They're, they're helping us get through hard times. We don't wanna mess with them. 
We don't want them to go away. And so for some of us on the inside, we have this sin and then right in front of it is like this bouncer guy who's like protecting it that you've hired. He looks like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, right? Like some of us on the outside in church are like, yeah, hey, and we're happy and we're worshiping God. And on the inside, you look like this. Don't talk about him like that. You know, like don't talk about my sin. I'm not done. You can go in any other room in my house, pastor. Talk about any other sin. Not this one. This one's mine. Yeah. And listen, the devil would love to hire the bouncer and give him health care benefits and like limited PTO. He wants to keep them there, all right? He wants to protect your sin. Why? Here's why. The devil will always build walls around the sin that's killing you. I'll show it to you in scripture. Ephesians chapter four. Here's what the Bible says. It says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's a beautiful picture. I wish you had more time to talk about it. I don't, but I think it's a promise from God. You don't have to let the sun go down on your anger. Here's what I think that means, okay? The day you got hurt can be the day you got healed. You don't have to hold on to it. You don't have to nurture your wrath. You can kill it. You can starve it. You can say, I'm sorry. You can go and forgive. Same day. You don't have to let a day go by. You can get healed today. A lot of times we don't do that though. And it leads to verse 27, which says this. When we hold on to anger, it gives a foothold. Somebody say foothold. A foothold to the devil. Now, when you think of the word foothold, I don't know what you think of. And so I Googled it because all good pastors use Google to write their messages. And so I Googled the word foothold and every picture was like a rock climber. You know, and they're on this like, you know, rocky crevicey foot thing. And like, it's this ledge and all that. That's not what it is in scripture. Okay. Uh, the New Testament narrative that you and I read was originally written in Greek. And here's the Greek word for foothold. It's the word topos. Okay. Topos, a place or a room. When we live in anger, we give the devil a topos or a room. In other words, when we live in anger, we literally give the devil walls to live in, in our heart rent free, like we're friends or something. He's got a key to my house. He can come over any time. I am giving him access to my heart, okay? I know that when I, when I live in wrath and anger, right? When somebody says something crazy about me or sends me a mean email, which happens from time to time, it's okay, I forgive you. But like, if I stay there in anger and wrath, I'm giving the devil access to my heart and maybe to my relationships. Like we shouldn't be naive. I think we often think that we sin in private. I think our sin life affects our relational life and our family life more than we think. And so I know if I stay in wrath, I'm giving him access, not only to me, but maybe my wife and my kids and my church. What will? Anger and offense. What's the answer? Fire Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Like fire the bouncer in your heart. Let's get rid of him today, right? Like we all have to start off with Psalm 139, which says, God, search me and know my heart. Is there any wrath in there? Is there any offense in there? Now here's the problem with offense. Everybody's offended all the time. You notice this? This is the culture we live in. People are offended all the time. I remember I couldn't sneeze in public for like two years. I was nervous, you know? If I sneeze the wrong way, people are gonna hate me. I remember I was the guy where like my nose would stick out the mask. I don't know if that was you. And uh, people would just yell at me in public. I remember one time I was at Costco. Costco, it's a godly place. I love Costco. And somebody yelled at me. They're like, hey, put your mask up, you nose rebel. I'm like, whoa, and even work there, you know? Like, what's a nose rebel? I wasn't even doing it on purpose. I just have a big nose. It's my cross to bear. You know what I mean? I don't know. You got to watch what you do and say and post. And I'm not really a person that gets offended all that easily. At least that's what I think. Who knows? Maybe this message is for me. Anyway, uh, I had to think about that before. Uh, takes a lot to get to me, except sometimes there's these little tic-tac comments that people say that really tick me off. I remember this one time I was in a tuck shop and I was buying a tux and I was in a really bad mood. That's really important to say. I wasn't close to Jesus in this moment. I need to say that because I'm gonna need some grace for what I did. And so <laughs> here's what I did. And so by the way, I was in a bad mood too because like $200 to rent a tux for 24 hours. What? It's terrible. I was just mad. It was too much. So I go to pay for it and I pull out my credit card and I'm looking for the chip reader to like put it in and I can't find it. <laughs> and there's like people behind me staring at me. It was really crowded and busy. So I'm starting to stress out. And the dude behind the counter is just staring at me. Can see me struggling, just stares at me. <laughs> And he looks at me and he's like, oh yeah, there's no chip reader. You got to swipe it, bud. Oh, I didn't know we were buds, you know? When did that happen? Shouldn't we go to lunch first? I don't know. What's happening? 
And it kind of dawns on you, you know, like he's insulting me. What is he doing, you know? Sorry I couldn't figure out your 37-year-old credit card machine with no chip reader, bud. You know, I'm like mad. I thought that, I didn't say it out loud. And then I go to sign my name and it doesn't work. Like it won't work. The little pen thing is like not working, you know? And he looks at me, he's like, oh, you gotta do it again, pal. <laughs> pal! Is that a promotion or a demotion? We don't know. Like, what's pal? Can we define our relationship? I'm not really sure what, what this is. You know, I'm confused. And he's saying it in front of all these people. I'm mad. And so when he calls me pal, I fire back. I said, thanks, guy. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. I need a lot of grace. I was mad. Here's what happens though. I call him guy and he's like, all right. He got real happy. Super weird. I'm like, what's happening? I tried to insult him, you know, and he made his day. And... Uh, He's like, all right, that's awesome. I'm like, it's some mental ninja stuff going on. He's messing with me. He was, he was super nice to me the rest of the time. Okay, we get to the very end. He's like, hey man, I just wanna thank you. What a great experience it's been with you. In fact, if you need anything at all, here's my business card. He gives me his card. And I'm like, confused, right? I'm like, thanks, chief. No, I didn't call him chief. I didn't say it. Say, no, 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 no. I, I thought it, I didn't say it. Anyway, so I, I walk out of the store confused. I looked down at his business card. His real first name is Guy. That's his name. <laughs> he thought I remembered him from last time. It's like his service is so spectacular, you can't forget Guy, you know? <laughs> Crazy. Now here's the thing. In that moment, it was a really ironic moment for me because it shed light and taught me this is what offense really does. <laughs> like we get offended at people to try to mess with them. All it does is mess with you. In fact, I'll say it like this, holding on to wrath and offense hurts you much more than it hurts them. You gotta get this today. I, I tried to mess with him. <laughs> All it did was mess with me because that's what offense really does. I heard a pastor say like this one time, um, you holding on to bitterness is like you drinking poison, hoping it hurts them. That's not how it works, right? We, we think, man, I'm gonna be so mad at them. That'll show them. I'm gonna be mad, I'm gonna lose sleep, that'll show him, right? I'm gonna be real awkward around him when I see him. I'm gonna bug eye, I'm like, oh, hey, happy to see, we're glad you came, you know? Just gonna make him feel weird, that'll show him, right? And it doesn't show him anything, it just makes you look weird, right? It just messes with you. This is what bitterness actually does. I think so often we're thinking that people are waiting on our next move, I think there's a narcissism in culture where people think they're waiting to see my reaction, aren't they? People are waiting on my next Instagram post. Probably not, I don't know, maybe. And so we often think that and it's not true. People are often not as obsessed about our bitterness as we are. They're not losing sleep. They're over there eating Doritos, thinking about their next vacation, right? They, they might not even know you're mad. We often think, man, they know how mad I am and they're, they're not gonna come say, they might not know. <laughs> One of the greatest myths in communication is that it actually happened. Just because you said something, just because you bug-eyed them, hey, good to see you, yeah. Like, that might have not sent the message you thought you were trying to send. They might not know. They might think you're wrong. <laughs> and so what, what, what's the point? Bitterness is not a viable option, and yet we choose it all the time. And that's what I need you to know. It's a choice. Contrary to popular belief, wrath, anger, bitterness, it is not a feeling. It often provides a bad feeling. It is a choice. It is something that you choose. I'll say it like this. An offense can happen in a moment but being offended is a decision. You don't have to stay mad, <laughs> you don't. Like some of us come into church and we're singing about how free we are and you're not free. <laughs> you're smiling and your hands are up and you're not free, right? There's a contradiction between what's coming out of my mouth and what's in my heart, right? They're, they are not on the same page when I'm in wrath and I'm in bitterness. You know, sometimes we sing better than we live. That's true, if we actually lived out some of these songs, it would change our life. And I think that's probably for most of us. All of us probably have at least one person we need to forgive. Some of y'all have a long list, all right? Let's pull it out today. And let's actually talk about it because it's really unhealthy in our life, right? Harboring unforgiveness. It'll make you harder on yourself. I'm gonna talk about that first. It'll ruin your relationships with other people because you can have trust issues. Worst of all, it's gonna ruin your relationship with God. You can be nothing like Jesus. You know, and I think when you talk about forgiveness, what's interesting about our culture, I don't know if you've noticed this, our like leaders and celebrities and politicians not really known for forgiveness in America. You know what I mean? Like, it's not what they're known for. You know, it's interesting to see like leaders and famous people go at each other on the Twitter or in like a political debate or something like that. You ever sit back and you're like, this is America. These are our leaders. 
You know, it's kind of embarrassing, actually. Just kind of going at each other. It's crazy. It's embarrassing, right? Sometimes a big platform can reveal how small a person really is. That's what the Bible says, Proverbs 27, 21. That's a different message. But God made it really clear to me today, if you wanna be set free, you gotta set some people free <laughs> out of that prison in your heart. And there's no better time to talk about it than right now. You know, holidays is really ironic. I don't know if you ever thought about this. Holidays are supposed to be the happiest days of the year. You get like time off work and stuff, right? It's supposed to be like a lot of joy. And often it does provide that. But sometimes holidays are just a reminder of what we don't have anymore. The challenges that face our family, the people that have hurt you. Think about Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Happiest days of the year. Yes, sometimes they're just a reminder of how messed up our family is or how messed up my relationship is with so-and-so. And they might not even know it. You might go around family stuff and you're just trying to have a good time, but on the inside, you're like, I don't wanna be here right now. And that's why I was praying over this this week. And I just felt like the Lord say, listen, <laughs> we need to forgive some folks. You might never enjoy holidays until you can forgive like Jesus. But there's no greater time to celebrate forgiveness or to practice it than Advent. We're about to go into Advent. That's the season between Thanksgiving and Christmas. The word Advent simply means the arrival of a significant or royal person. We believe that person's name is Jesus. And Jesus is the great forgiver. It's what he came to do. So how do we celebrate him coming? We forgive some folks. Or we'll never be like him or live like him or be as free as we could be. In fact, I'll say it like that. You'll never be as free as you could be until you forgive the people who've hurt you the most. How do we do that? Because that's hard. <laughs> I got five points, all right? How do we forgive people and talk about forgiveness? Here's the first one, number one. Number one, maybe start by forgiving yourself. There might be some stuff in your own life that you need to forgive yourself for. What this is gonna do is make you a person of forgiveness. It's not just gonna be something you do once in a while. It's part of who you are. It's part of your identity, right? When you start your day with, Lord, I need your forgiveness today. And because I know I need it, I'm gonna give it because they need it too. And I don't think we often spend a lot of time receiving forgiveness from Jesus, right? You might've thought, I did that once 27 years ago at a camp, right? I lifted my hand. That's a daily thing because you've been sinning since then, you know? You've done some stuff since then. So we don't often spend time receiving forgiveness from God. We might be lazy in prayer. I think the biggest thing though is probably shame. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. We forget that God didn't just give us mercy, which is not giving you a punishment you deserve. He then doubled down and gave you grace which is giving you a gift on top of that that you don't deserve. It's a grace thing. It's not a works thing. You might think, man, I, I don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve it. <laughs> of course you don't. That's why it's called grace. My son did not deserve the Lego that I bought him last week. He had a bad attitude. I gave it to him anyway. Why? So he could stop crying and because of this thing called grace, all right? I was teaching him about grace. You don't deserve this. <laughs> I don't deserve it either, you know? And so to him, grace is Legos. That's what that is, okay? And so... You don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyway. It's not based on what you deserve. That, that's actually not, not what it's about. And so we gotta spend time. Like we do things that shock us. I don't know if you ever shock yourself. <laughs> you ever do anything you're like, wow, I can't believe I did that. I have a big mouth. I don't know if you've known this. And so sometimes I lay in bed at night. I'm like, I said what? I can't believe I said that like that to that person. You know, like I thought that, like, wow. That made them feel terrible or unheard or unseen or whatever. It's called a regret, by the way. I don't know if you have any regrets. Some people say, I have no regrets. You ever heard that? It's like top five dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, right? No regrets. Um, I'm not saying you should obsess on them and think on them, but like a regret is if I could go back, I'd do it different. Some of us have regrets this morning on the way to church, right? Like we do. And so that's okay. We need to give those to the Lord. But we shock ourselves sometimes by the things that we do. You know who's not shocked? God is not shocked by what you do. God is not up in heaven watching you commit one of the seven deadly sins. Like, he did what? With who? Where? Oh, man, I didn't see that one coming, you know? He didn't look at Gabriel like, hey, go get Jesus and a virgin and another baby, we're going back. You know, like, that didn't work the first time. <laughs> he never said that. You know why? Because he planned for it. He planned for all the things that you would do, the dumb things you would do. He planned on it and he forgave you. So you should just forgive yourself. And maybe you need to take time this holiday season to forgive yourself. Because if you don't, it's gonna be very hard for you to forgive other people. Say it like this, it'll be very hard to practice forgiving others if you don't practice forgiving yourself. Why? Because that's who you are. You're a hard person, right? I'm hard on you, why? Because I'm hard on me. 
And I have a very hard time with that. I'm very hard on myself. I need no motivation from any other humans because I am very, very hard on myself. And I walk around, I'm, I'm critiquing myself all day long. And so it's made me realize that's why I can be hard on my wife and our team here and people in my life. Why? Because I'm hard on me. I'm hard on you because I'm hard on me. But if I forgave myself, maybe I'd give grace away a little bit more. Maybe we need to start by forgiving ourselves. Here's number two. Number two, understand how forgiveness works, okay? When we don't forgive other people, we show God that we don't really understand how forgiveness works. It's built on this like grace idea. that's a free gift from the Lord that you don't deserve. And so we need to give that away to other people. I'll say it like this. When you accepted Jesus's free gift of forgiveness, you gave up your right not to forgive others. We gave up the right to choose to be bitter and stay there. You're like, is that in the Bible? It is, thanks for asking. Matthew chapter six, all right? Jesus in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount teaches us about prayer. It's a very famous text called the Lord's Prayer. What's so funny about these verses is we rarely know what comes after them, right? Like what's John 3, 17 say? It actually gets better. We don't often know that. Here's the very following two verses on the Lord's Prayer. It ends in verse 13. Here's what verse 14 says. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's scary. <laughs> that's terrifying. You're like, that's in the Bible? It is. Like, I've never seen it. It's been in there a long time, you know? <laughs> You've changed. It, it hasn't. Now, he's, he's teaching, the context is prayer. He's teaching people on prayer. He draws a parallel between the connection between prayer and forgiveness. And here's what I think that means for us. Perhaps the number one blockage from God answering your prayer is the wrath in your heart, is the anger in your heart. Like we come to God with our list. We're like, hey, I want all these things. I need you to speak to me about these things. And he's like, can we just do the forgiving thing first? We need to start there, actually. That's a better starting point, right? Because that's how forgiveness works. And you might think, you know what though? That they won't change, right? And, and they won't say they're sorry. And I think a lot of times we get hung up on forgiving people because they haven't said they're sorry yet. And they haven't actually changed yet. And you don't need any of those things to forgive people. Number three, unhitch your healing and forgiveness from their actions. Okay, this is a big deal today. We could talk about this for a long time. Again, we wait for people to say sorry. We wait for people to change. And what the Bible teaches, you don't need to wait for that. You don't need for them to change how they vote or what they said, or you don't need any of that. You, you can forgive them right now, okay? There, there is no evidence in scripture that the people who nailed Jesus to the cross had any remorse for it. They did not take it back. They were not sorry. And yet Jesus says one of the seven famous things he says on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. They did not change. He forgives them anyway, which shows us we could do the same thing. That's how good forgiveness is. It can heal you now. You don't need to wait for them, right? It can set you free today. I'll speak for myself. I, I, I've like fantasized before. I don't know if you've ever done this. I have fantasized about people coming to me and apologizing. You ever, you ever thought about that? And like, I'm just like, fan, like, I'm sitting around like, that'll be a good day, you know? I can't wait until they come here on their knees, in tears, poem prepared, you know? They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I haven't slumbered in weeks because of what I've done to you. How can thou even look us in my direction, you know? I'll do anything now. And it's like, yeah, that's gonna be great. Okay, how many know that never happens? Never, that's some Shakespeare stuff, right? That's weird. I've thought it in my head. Yeah, I'm like waiting. I've been in the other room, right? Like 25 feet from my wife for two hours. I'm like, she's coming in here. I'm not going in there. It's been two hours. I'm not caving now, you know? She's coming in here. With cry, she's gonna cry. That's it. She's gonna be that sorry, you know? It just doesn't happen like ever, you know? I always have to go to her. Anyway, <laughs> what's the point? Unhitch your need to get healed and to forgive. Unhitch that from what they do. Okay, I'll say it like this forgiveness severs the source of suffering by unhitching your healing from their choices. You're saying, you know what? I've, I've suffered enough, man. I'm not gonna stay in this place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have an upgrade. I'm gonna, I'm gonna forgive. I'm gonna deal with my pain with God and other people, not them. You know why? Because they can't heal you. We are waiting for other people to come heal us. That's not their job. That's God's job. Their sorry might not heal you. It might not be everything that you thought. That's what I need. No, that's God's job. God gets to come and heal us. That's what he does. 
I need to go to him. Okay, I get to forgive. Now, that doesn't mean you guys need to be best friends. It's a whole other message, but there is a difference between forgiveness and restoration, okay, where they get restored back to friendship, back to position, back to intimacy. That does require an apology for me. That, that does require some trust. And if we don't have that, we're not gonna be very close. That does require you to respect me and like protect boundaries. We need that, okay? That's called restoration, it's different. Forgiveness doesn't need any of that. You're like, but, but you don't know what they did. They need to pay and maybe they will. But number four, we need to let God be the judge because that's his job, okay? Things go wrong in our life when we try to take God's job. And that's what wrath does. Wrath takes God's job and it says, my version of justice is better than yours. I am now judge, jury, and executioner. So wrath does. Okay, that's what the devil did, by the way. The Bible tells us that the devil fell from heaven because he tried to take God's job. He deceived Adam and Eve because he said, if you eat this apple, you're gonna have God's job. Things go wrong when we take God's job. I'll say it like this. You're never more like the devil than when you try to take God's job. Okay, and we think, man, I can't forget about it though. I can't forget what they did. I'm not saying you have to forget. You know, the people in the Bible, sins are hard to forget because they're printed in the Bible, right? It's like hard to forget those, right? It's hard to let go of Bathsheba. It's in there for everyone to see. I'm not saying you have to forget about it, but when you, when you welcome Jesus and his healing, forgiving power in your story, he rewrites the story. He gives it a better ending, okay? When we allow Jesus and his forgiveness to enter our past stories of pain, he can rewrite them. He rewrites them. Again, he gives it a better ending. And I've had that in my own life, right? Where I've, I've tried to forgive people for years and sometimes I've convinced myself that I have. You ever done that? You're like, I forgave them. I love them. You're like, you look mad. That doesn't look like love, you know? <laughs> you look angry. I had a mentor tell me that a few, I'm like, no, I forgave them. I did, I forgave them. And he's like, whoa. Are you sure? Every time they get brought up, you like grimace. You know, you look like you're gonna attack me. And uh, you feel this need to slander them, just kind of slight them, you know? They get brought up and you're like, yeah, I remember, I remember them. And yeah, crazy. And you just bring up like slights like, every time. Are you, are you sure you forgave them? If you saw them right now, it'd be weird, right? Are you sure you forgave them? I'm like, okay, I get it. Thanks, chief. You know, I didn't say that. Anyway, and so... You know, can you imagine if Jesus forgave you like that? Jesus like, I forgive you now. You can come to heaven, but never pray to me again. You know, like that'd be crazy. Jesus doesn't say that, right? We often treat people like that. It's not really forgiveness. Maybe there's another layer there, but let me tell you, every layer of forgiveness, there's another layer of, layer of healing for you. There's another layer of freedom for you, and you need that. We need that, maybe this holiday season. God, you don't know what they've done to me. He's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> don't forget my job, right? God is not just the judge. You know what he is? He's the healer and he's the restorer. God can restore to you everything that somebody took from you. And he does it all throughout scripture. He says, I'm the restorer. I am the good shepherd who leads you beside the still waters and restores your soul. I can restore you. You know, I was praying for someone in our church a few weeks ago, and I felt like God put Proverbs 6 on my heart. They're praying for their family, and their family's kind of in a broken place, and they're just praying, and they've been fighting for years for their family. And I just felt like God put Proverbs 6 on my heart. When Solomon was king, he had a law in Proverbs 6. When somebody stole something, they had to pay it back seven times what they stole. And so we just prayed over them that whatever they feel like the enemy has stolen in their life, he would pay it back seven times. The relationship with their kids, their marriage, the years of dreaming and things that God has put in their life, he would pay it back seven times. I don't know if that's a word for you, for your heart, but you could just take that for you. You feel like somebody's taken something from you. The enemy has taken something from you. I believe God can restore. He did it for Job. Job was better off the second time because God is the restorer. That's his job. What does he ask us to do? Forgive people. That's our job, right? And you're never more like Jesus than when you forgive. And so I'll end with that. Number five, be like Jesus. And how do we forgive like Jesus? How did he forgive those dudes who were like nailing him to the cross and stuff? Here's how. Forgiving like Jesus allows us to see people through their brokenness, not our offense. We don't just see people through how it affected me. You notice that broken people tend to hurt people hurt people, hurt people, and they need some help. As they're nailing Jesus to the cross, he looks over and he sees them. He's like, man, they don't know what they're doing. 
They, they don't know God. They don't have a relationship with, with me. They need help. And so he prays for them because he's looking through their lens, not his. He's not looking through his pain. He's looking through their pain. And there are some people in our life, maybe in the season, maybe they're in your family and they need some healing, man. They need some Jesus. They need some forgiveness. Are you gonna give it to them? Because <laughs> that's what the whole Bible is about. It's a, it's a book of forgiveness. It's what it is. You see it all throughout scripture that people not only forgive, but then they restore and they bless. Forgiveness changes everything. Listen, Joseph should have never forgiven his family for selling him into slavery in Genesis, but he doesn't stop there. He then saves his whole family from a famine because forgiveness changes everything. Hosea should have never forgiven his wife Gomer for all the affairs, but he doesn't stop there. He then commits to being a better husband and sticking around because forgiveness changes everything. Barnabas should have never forgiven Saul for persecuting all his friends in the beginning of Acts. He doesn't stop there. He's like, I'm gonna train you, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you become Paul, the guy who wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Stephen, the first Christian martyr. This is my favorite story in the Bible on forgiveness. We didn't have time to read about it today. Acts chapter seven, he's the first Christian martyr. The Bible says Saul's killing him, the same Saul, and Stephen prays for him. He says, God, do you see that guy? I want you to forgive him. That's crazy. And God did, God restored him because forgiveness changes everything. And, and how many know Jesus Christ should have never forgiven me and you for all the things that we've done in our life, but he doesn't stop there. He then offers us a life of freedom full of the Holy Spirit and abundant life. Why? Because forgiveness changes everything. I don't know what wrath might be in your heart in this holiday season, but I'd encourage you, let it out. <laughs> let forgiveness fill your heart as Jesus forgives us. And maybe some of you, you need that today. You're like, that forgiveness you're talking about, that's what I need with Jesus. If that's you, I wanna pray for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we close? If you're in here today and you say, hey man, that's me. I need forgiveness from Jesus. I wanna follow Jesus. Maybe for the first time or the 31st time, you say, I haven't been following him. I haven't been choosing him. Today, I wanna surrender. I wanna ask him to forgive me and therefore spend eternity with him. With every head down, if that's you today, you say, I need that forgiveness. I wanna be saved by Jesus. Can you just lift your hand? I just wanna pray for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see a ton of hands. Okay, thank you all over the place. You put your hands down. Anybody else? You say, that's me. I need this forgiveness. God, I thank you for these. Anybody bold enough to lift a hand? Would we know today, there's no magic in a hand raise. It's just a moment to say, I'm, I'm making a decision. I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna receive your free gift of salvation. I was a sinner, I am a sinner, but now I'm a saint, bigger. That's my identity, that's who I am. God, I pray you become the realest thing in their life right now. Would they know that what comes after is the real story? The Bible is about 1% salvation, 99% following you. And so that's what we get to do from here. We get to be a church and rally around people and say, we're gonna help you follow Jesus now. And I pray you'd be good and diligent in doing that. Would we know that our church largely exists for this moment to see people come into the family here and in heaven? God, I pray for the rest of us today as we close. Whatever we're gonna go out and do today, we're gonna watch football and Christmas shop and eat and whatever. I pray we just take one moment, Lord, and think about somebody we need to forgive. Maybe that's ourself. Lord, I pray we take a moment and receive your forgiveness in a fresh way. Would you pour it out today in a fresh way? I need to forgive me. <laughs> Can't believe I did that. Lord, so forgive us. And I pray that as that washes over our life, would we give it away for free? In so doing, would people uh, come out of prison in our hearts and our lives as we give them forgiveness freely like you gave it to us. So Lord, we love you. We pray that whoever you spoke into our life today, would it, would it go down into the depths in our inner being and take root there and change our life? And so Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.